Enter the world of the paranormal. UFOs. Alien abductions. Ghosts. Out of body experiences. Past lives. Distant viewing. Government cover ups. Welcome to Sightings on the Radio with your host, Jeff Reddins. Well, good evening once again, everybody. Tonight, we're going to take you live and direct to New Zealand and a fascinating trip through the mind and the thoughts of one of the most talented scientists and environmental visionaries on this little planet of ours. His name is Bruce De Palma, and a number of years ago, he gave up on the United States and moved on to New Zealand, where he is now a citizen. Why did Bruce De Palma, a brilliant scientific inventor and genius, leave the United States? Well, that is a remarkable story, which we will hear tonight, and it has to do with free energy technology and the dramatic and well-noticed threat that Bruce De Palma's genius posed to not only the oil cartels, but essentially to the entire world monetary power structure. Among many other things, Bruce De Palma is a graduate of MIT back in 1958. He was a lecturer in the Electrical Engineering Department in 1967, a director of 3D research at Polaroid, assistant to Dr. Edwin Land, who founded Polaroid, of course, also assistant to Dr. Harold Edgerton, founder of EG&G. Bruce De Palma is also known among many people as the inventor of what is called the N-Machine. It's a space power generator, and we'll talk about that tonight. What Bruce De Palma has to say is well worth listening to, and if you've got tape recorders, I hope you can tape this show. Bruce, are you there? I am. How are greetings, you? Greetings from the South Pacific. Well, <laughs> yes, it's uh, it's good to hear your voice. Now, I'm not being totally facetious. <laughs> All right, it's nice to talk to you again. Yes, uh, now, uh, we tried this uh, some months ago and uh, had a, had a few problems, shall we say, and leave it at that. Uh, where are we here in, in 1997, Bruce? I keep hearing from people all the time that the pace of life and the pace of this planet is ever accelerating, and people really, I think, not only believe that, but I think they are experiencing it. Do you uh, do you agree with that synopsis? Oh, I think uh, very definitely. It has to do with <clears throat> it has to do with communications, and uh, the internet is the. Uh, is the basis of it, the fact that scientists around the world can talk to each other instantaneously, uh, as opposed to what you know as snail mail, has caused the dialogue between various scientific groups to just increase in uh, rapidity, you might say, in back and forth. And the communications connectivity of this Internet and the ability to send messages so conveniently is stimulated research uh, because it's easy and cheap to talk to people, you know, in, all over, uh, Africa, Russia, you know, the middle of nowhere. Sure. I was going to ask you if, uh, if the Internet, uh, Bruce, has in fact been the greatest uh, boost of energy to modern science, uh, maybe in memory. Well, the scientists dreamed it up. I mean, uh, the scientists dreamed up this situation so that they... Uh, could have communications between the Pentagon and defense contractors, and they set it up uh, for scientific communication. So what happens? That's what, well, of course, you can find anything on the Internet, but mainly uh, most of us who use this as the communications medium, we bypass all the hoo-ha. We know where we are. We know what our addresses are, and the dialogue just goes back and forth. And It enables you to bring together a a, a collection of minds in one location at an affordable price uh, and have all kinds of conversations, you know, chat rooms and so forth. And this, and in fact, the, the whole communications exploration is behind the fact that you and I can speak together. Here I am in the South Pacific on the other side of the planet. Mm -hmm. And, And this is an affordable situation. So, uh, this is, this communications is, is, of course, the foundation of all new thought revolutions starts in communications and talk. So, uh, because the, the globe is so vast and, and, uh, we can't get around to see each other that easily, but we certainly can sit in front of a, a screen and, and, uh, chat, or you can hook video into these things, and at a slow rate, of course, you can, snapshot pictures of yourself and see who you're talking to. So this is an open-ended situation. Where it's going to go, I don't know. But, you know, we're only one day after the date of August 27, 1997 of the Terminator movie. 
that <laughs> said, <laughs> you know, well, that's when the defense uh, network computers got smart. <laughs> <laughs> And right. we have, right. yeah, we've got we've got this com- amazing interlocked computer system around the world, and it's getting smart. Now I think it's getting smart in a good way, you know. And uh, it's it's going to help everything. Has uh, so, anybody uh, effectively, Bruce, uh, essayed the impact of the internet uh, on this planet of ours? I don't think so. I think it's so huge and it's growing so fast that the impact has yet to be fully uh, plumbed. Uh, I think it's probably more uh, overwhelming in its potential than television was. Oh, I think so. In fact, I think that the Internet uh, on a cosmic scale represents a television for people that don't want to be sold anything (laughs) or at least want to have the medium under their total control. Right. Well said, yeah. You see, because if you look what kids are doing these days, they're not watching uh, mainstream TV and commercials and cartoons. I mean, some hypnotized people do, but mainly kids are in front of screens sending messages back and forth to each other. And uh, this is a very intelligent activity. It, it involves learning how to read and write and express yourself. And I think in all ways, this is a very good sign. How big of a threat does this new freedom of thought and uh, interaction pose to the uh, the moneyed group that uh, has a handle on much of this planet? Well, it's hard to say. I think that um, uh, the Internet has tremendous economic advantages uh, for this money group, if, if there is such a thing. And uh, uh, I just don't think anybody knows where it's going. I think it's in a very experimental stage. And, you know, we're... We're we're in the midst of something which some of us, the older ones like me, I can look back to when television came in, and I can look back to when cassette decks came in, and then compact discs and stereo records, and I can see how each time these advances came in, different things started happening. So we're in the middle of the one, oh, another one right now. Now, 50 years from now, we can look back and say, well, yes, the, the connectivity of the intellectual uh, world was increased by the Internet, and that resulted in X, Y, Z. But the X, Y, Z, you know, is in the formation stages now because the Internet is on its ascendancy, and we don't know where it's going. So. It's, uh, it's playing a tremendous role in heightening the awareness of people around the world to the problems we all collectively face as a species on this planet. One of the things that you uh, are most concerned about is certainly the environmental uh, decay of, uh, of our world. And uh, there are people who say it's, it's too late. There are people who say it's not quite too late. And then there are people who don't seem to care. Uh, <laughs> we've got a crisis, certainly, uh, we're facing. Uh, the more we look into it, the more we see horrible things. Uh, I hate to sound negative, but on, uh, on my website at uh, www.sightings.com, I recently posted a story where, Bruce, they are now using radioactive wastes uh, as fertilizer components and spreading it over thousands of acres of land upon which grain for cattle and sheep and so on uh, is raised and grain for us as well, ultimately. So that's the kind of thing we're looking at here. Make a buck at all costs. And I'm not sure how we can turn that around. Well, that's the idea of taking something that you want to throw away and selling people on it as a good thing, uh, uh, well, we could get into that one. Yes, we do have big problems in this world, but the 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 global response now has a network in which it can respond to itself into, and so for the first time, for the, for first, the first time. time. You see, even Alvin Toffler and you know Future Shock never anticipated the internet and what that might do, and so yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, he didn't. Right. And you see, the thing is, uh, uh, sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. And when things are happening full blast around you, you say, well, you know, what's this, what's that? But this Internet and the conversations which are taking place over it and the information which is available through it, uh, this is the, this is, look, <clears throat> we, we, we're very much involved in this because I have students around me and they're all very computer literate. And so, uh, I'm in touch with this thing, but let's talk about how this will eventually reach the ordinary man and woman on the street. And as I see it, the next generation of computers are going to be ones that you can talk to. 
and uh, the, 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 the housewife can come home and say to the screen, uh, find me some asparagus at the local grocery store and order me so-and-so and have it delivered, this, that, and the next thing. And instead of having to type in all this stuff, it'll all be done verbally. And also newspapers and magazines will be accessed and printed out. And uh, you could set it up so that you could have uh, them printed out at night and waiting for you in the morning, you see. Amazing. All right, Bruce, hold on. We'll take our first break and come right back uh, and talk more. Uh, Bruce De Palma, the guest tonight. Uh, much to talk about. Your call is invited. We'll get to that a little later here at Sightings on the radio. All right. Welcome back to Sightings on the Radio. You can reach Jeff live at 1-800-745-6655. Hey, welcome back. We're on the phone live and direct to New Zealand tonight. A uh, great pleasure to have as my guest Bruce De Palma, inventor, scientist, uh, enfant terrible of the uh, free energy set years ago, left the United States, is now a citizen of New Zealand. Uh, he is a teacher. He has sought out uh, the world over for his opinions on many different topics. We're starting off tonight just kicking the uh, concept of this, this awesome enterprise called the Internet around, which many people think actually almost is a living entity uh, with a consciousness of its own, a collective consciousness. Uh, would you buy into that one, Bruce? Um, uh, the Internet is, a uh, number one, a communications medium. And uh, all I can say is uh, something along this line. You know... Uh, on the east coast of the United States, uh, when I was living there in the 60s and 70s, they had two power blackouts. And this happened because lightning strokes triggered off uh, various consequences in the control systems which regulated all the power, power generators in Canada and New England, and they all got out of synchronization in ways that had not been thought of before. Now, if we can look at the Internet as a big system which is connected to itself in various ways through all sorts of computers, it, through some combination of stimulations, which we don't know when they'll occur, might initiate a sequence of happenings which somebody could call intelligence of some kind. Hmm. I, I don't think intelligence in computers is going to be something that man creates I think it's something that's going to create itself as a result of the fact that man makes a big enough computer for certain things to start happening in it that the men haven't dreamed of yet, you see. But at least they've set up... The, I mean, that's how the human brain operates when you're a child. You you come into the world with this huge computer, this brain, but it doesn't really start operating until it learns for a while. And so we're creating the brain with the Internet and its connections to all the computers and the mainframes and the interactions of various sorts. And what is going to arise out of this is yet to happen. But it's a possibility. I'm sure a lot of people in cybernetics have thought about this. And uh, there's a whole other group of people that work on artificial intelligence. But I don't think that's the way intelligence happens. You don't create it. I think it arises. It's very, very interesting, uh, Bruce. Uh, this, this is a, a mega brain under construction, so to speak, and when it reaches a critical mass, it may take on a life of its own. It's remarkable. That, yeah, that's exactly right, yes, yes. Uh, amazing. We have uh, access now to the Internet, uh, uh, basically down to every man and every woman's status uh, with what we call over here Web TV. Uh, for less than $300, you can get a keyboard little electronic circuitry, plug one end into your phone jack, the other end into your TV, and you are online. And we have uh, many people in this country listening to the program via web TV. It's a, it's a great uh, democratization of this medium for people, and I'm very happy to see it. Well, that's right. And as I said, uh, usually the things that happen in this world are the subconscious wishes of people in general. And I think people in general want to communicate they don't want to be held up by commercials. They want information. And so what materializes is the Internet. And so our, what our kids are watching are their own TVs that they can control and only watch the programs that they want to watch. And they can tune in and tune out. So one of the things that I noticed be, just prior to the Internet was, you know, because I'm around students all the time, is that the students of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s have this ability to just tune out. 
They can be looking at you. They can apparently be listening to you, but they're not hearing you. And this comes from the fact that when they see commercials or things they don't want to watch, there's some kind of pollution detector that cuts in, and they just don't react. <laughs> so uh, come this, this idea that we just want to hear the things we want to hear and we want to go to the, go to the sources that we want to go to finally manifests itself in a television screen controlled by the operator now, not by the transmitter. And so the idea of our present system, I mean, this goes into energy, too, and we can lead into this from this thought, but, I mean, all of the systems on the planet derive from, you know, the feudal days where some centralized source controlled everything. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, they control the land and the food in the beginning, but now they control the money and the energy and the credit and so forth and so on. And, and uh, the idea of, of a centralized source doesn't work in the Internet. It, it, I mean, a, a television station is a centralized source, you see, and it only can transmit in one direction. And so the fact is the world is shifting into a different paradigm. It's generalizing itself so that everyone in every room and every location, whether you're in Tibet or, you know, or in Terra del Fuego or someplace, you can be on that Internet and you can this, communicate yeah. in and hold a job and everything. Yeah, it's, this is literally reversing the traditional pyramid of power. It's turning it inside out. That's right. That's exactly right. And it's happening very quietly, all by itself. And it's not somebody's power trip. It's a natural manifestation of, of the, you know, the angst of mankind wanting to expand into a, a, a different kind of a dimension, which is now made possible through our communication abilities. So I'm, I'm see, I, I really think that the Internet is a product of science, and science itself is a product of communication, clear communication. I mean, people telling each other the truth about experiments and what they see and what they find. And anything that results from clear communication has got to be more clear communication. Do you get the, see the analogy I'm making? Yes, I do. Sure. Yeah. So, so this is a very good development. And, you know, people can talk about doom and gloom, and uh, you mentioned something about, uh, you know, the world, this, everything's going to blow up or something. But every prophecy becomes self-fulfilling if you just sit down and don't do anything, you know. And uh, so if you just want to sit and watch, sure, the sky will someday fall. But you know, there are, not... that, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of people, Bruce, that, uh, that do just that. Uh, they would like to see prophecy fulfilled, and they're willing to sit around and wait for it to happen. However, I agree with you. I think that this Internet may have come along at the 11th hour for uh, for a lot of different reasons. It may be the ultimate liberating factor that uh, is now in our hands. Uh, I don't remember anything in my lifetime even close to it. It's it's so phenomenal and so big and so under understood, if you will, uh, that I think the potential is, is nothing less than thrilling. It is. And, you know, the people that are using it the most are the most computer literate of people who are the most intelligent and the most widely read and the most able to express themselves in, in words. And these are the people who generate the ideas which eventually come, manifest in the form of machines or new kinds of dishes or recipes or something. And this this is something good for our society. So, yes, yes. Uh, you know, if if I, I look at people and I say to them, you know, all the doom and gloomers, I look at and I said, you know, if, if the human race was built to self-destruct before it ever matured, then we wouldn't be talking to each other here. So there is a way out of all of this stuff. So many people have been uh, pretty much programmed uh, to be reflexive, to be uh, on the submission of uh, the submitting end of things, and uh, certainly this is changing. Let me read you, if I can, just for fun, to get uh, Bruce De Palma's reaction. Uh, some of the headline stories on, uh, on my website here, we have a pretty uh, eclectic mix of material always coming up, and I pass along for people to consider, and then it gets filed, of course. Let me read some headlines to you and, and see if you have any reaction to this. this is, talk about a mix. Uh, plasma weapons in Australia. Pat Robertson says, kill all UFO believers. Anti-AIDS mixture found in Gulf Vets blood. Mars South Peak photo shocker. Roswell-like material made. Corso data confirmed. Plasma fireballs linked to Japanese cult in Australia. 
Huge cigar-shaped UFO in UK. Complete list of 100 reported UFO crashes. Cities prepare for biochemical attack. Super-resistant bacteria found in U.S. Dr. Horowitz blasts CDC over AIDS-linked vaccines and anomalies on Martian South Peak. We're going to take a break now and uh, just a little serving of headlines for you, Bruce, to uh, ruminate over for a minute. We'll be back in about three minutes here at Sightings on the Radio. You're listening to Sightings on the Radio. And welcome back, everyone. We are on the phone live and direct uh, to Bruce De Palma in New Zealand. Uh, Bruce, uh, a remarkable mind amongst us all. I forgot the last uh, headline story on my website, uh, Bruce. It's uh, leukemia lurking in your hamburgers. So uh, we've got, uh, as I say, quite a pot there to stir. Well, right, and they're they're uh, they're going in <clears throat> a number of directions, but. Uh, I was just thinking about that collection of ideas, and uh, the one thing that strikes me right off is uh, I'm surprised that uh, there are as many weapons uh, producing uh, projects going as there are. You know, I'm in the South Pacific, and uh, these lights over Australia, as we call them down here, and the mini earthquakes and fireballs at night. and you, You've well, seen all that, haven't you? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, Australia's thinking about getting cruise missiles, and it's got submarines and so forth. And, and uh, there's a big uh, uh, flap going on here in New, New Zealand about a, a station here at a place called Huapai, which monitors the the Intelsat uh, satellites, which take all the telephone conversations across the Pacific to the United States, so that there's a special line which connects New Zealand to America to the CIA, which uh, monitors all those phone calls. And so this station is located on New Zealand, and it's here because the Americans want to have uh, the ability to monitor the phone calls of, between Japan and the South Pacific and Indonesia and India and so forth from this Intel sat, uh, satellite. And they're going to expand it because I, I think there are two Intel sat, sat, sat satellites. And uh, they're going to put a second antenna in. And there have been protests here. And the general mood is, is that, uh, you know, by having these kinds of 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 stations here we're we're only inviting uh, you know some kind of retaliation from some place and uh it's just something that new zealanders who are mainly interested in raising sheep and uh and uh, knitting wool sweaters and it's a very nice place and very ecologically wonderful balanced place they're not interested in getting involved in the karma of world power struggles and this, that. And so I'm just a little bit uh, worried about the fact that in a world which needs more stability, uh, more weapons are being produced. Uh, I mean, the the U.K. makes uh, eight nuclear bombs a month, I'm told, from some environmental uh, service. Why does anybody need to make any more nuclear anything anymore if if our main... Uh, concept is that we're going to try to bring the world to some kind of peaceful equilibrium. Now, uh, this sets you off into a kind of a, a thought uh, like this. Maybe the powers that be or the, the world government or whoever you want to call it have already decided that there are too many people on the planet. There's no way to solve the energy crisis that uh, pollution will overcome us all. And so uh, there's no necessity to, you know, do anything to conserve and just use up everything. And uh, then there'll be some terrible war of some kind. And uh, the best way to survive is to feather your nest with an underground base or, a, you know, maybe a moon base or Mar- ba- Mars base. It's the alternative three type yeah, uh, sure. c- scenarios, and uh, <clears throat> that that's a possibility. I mean, considering the way people are gobbling up everything in sight, we know that everything is going to run out very shortly, and there's, there, there'll be a big war. Well, I, you know, it's a funny thing. Here I am talking from New Zealand, but the reason I am in New Zealand is because of the kind of thoughts I think and the kinds of things which 
uh, people don't generally talk about. But if you look at the whole Middle East situation, the oil which comes from the Middle East is what's really important about the Middle East. And there's big customers for that oil. There's Europe and the West, and there's now China and Russia, because China's a net oil importer now, and Russia's running low on oil. It doesn't go on forever, and so all this tension develops about who's going to control it in America, regardless of whether it says it's going to be keeping the peace or something, still has troops in all these countries. It still has troops in 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 in, in uh, Yugoslavia or you know Sarajevo or wherever the Balkans. It's got right. troops in 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 uh, and where was that Kuwait? We have troops. You have troops in Egypt. They got part, some of them blown up last week. We have all these, and we've got uh, all kinds of carriers and things there. I mean, I. It seems to me that the people should have enough sense to know that if you have all this stuff in one place, somebody is going to trip over a cable sometime and <laughs> sit down on a button, and the whole thing will go off. And, and that what we really should be thinking about is putting some uh, thought into um, you know, some safer and much more sustainable solutions than trying to fight over what's left, if there's anything right. left, you know. Right, burning, the burning of, uh, of fossil fuels is, is, uh, is so arcane. This brings us really pretty much full circle back to the beginning when I mentioned in my introduction that uh, you gave up on the U.S. Tell us what you were doing, Bruce, in the 70s with the end machine and so forth and what led to you uh, actually just bailing out of this place. Well, it's like this. You see, my, I'm a basic physical scientist, and what that means is I'm interested in basic physical science. What is basic physical science? Well, it has to do with things like gravity and how much things weigh and, you know, inertia, you know, resistance to change in motion and, you know, things like the speed of light or how fast the planets revolve. Or, it's a very magnetism, very basic things I'm interested in. Now, there's a whole bunch of physicists that think that uh, we know everything there is to know about all these things, and we're on to some theory of the outer worlds, like uh, relativity or, I don't know, what string theories or whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. But I'm on the other end of things. I'm down there in the basement doing the experiments with the meters and the scales and things. And so I, I was very troubled in the 60s by what I saw as what we knew as the revolution in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and, and riots and so forth. And I saw through this thing, and I saw what's really at the base of this is energy. People, there's not enough energy to motivate society. So everybody, you, you know, if people had have a lot of spare time, uh, I guess they can go out and be revolutionaries. But if they have a happy job, they're well paid, and they're comfortable, they're not going to be out in the streets. You see, and the thing is, if we had enough work to keep everybody motivated and enough useful projects that people could get enthusiastic over, uh, then I think we'd have a happier world. And I saw energy and the cost of energy as being at the, the bottom of this, this great pyramid. Everything, this upside-down pyramid, rests on energy, and everything else comes from it. So you have that idea, but you say, all right, well, what am I going to do about it? Because everyone else is telling you, well, there's only a certain amount of energy in the world, you know, the conservation of energy, and if you use it all up, then it's gone, and we all curl up and die. And uh, this is so thoroughly drummed into you that, you, you know, you don't even think about ways out of it. And so I had to get over all that stuff. And then I started thinking about a gyroscope one afternoon, and I said, well, you know, here's something very fundamental. And uh, I thought I knew everything about it because I, you know, I believe Newton's laws of motion and their application to this situation. And then I started to say to myself, well, but there, I'm still not convinced about all this. And I performed a lot of independent experiments on gyroscopes that nobody had tried before. Now, you know, when I talk about something that people haven't tried before, I'm not talking about something complicated. I'm talking about something simple. Uh, look, when Galileo dropped objects off the Leaning Tower of Pisa and had a big one and a small one, mm -hmm. and he let them both go, he saw they both dropped at the same acceleration and hit the ground at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what I, it's a simple experiment, but what it means is no matter how big and heavy a thing is, it drops just as fast as a feather and in a vacuum without the air bothering and then that's right. very very you know real interesting 
Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a very, very unusual fact about things, and uh, it took. Uh, you know, a couple of hundred years for Newton to think up his ideas and and to figure out what he called inertia. Let me ask you to hold right there, yeah. Bruce. We All have right. another break coming up, and uh, get right back to you in about three minutes here at Sightings on the radio. Sightings on the radio. Call now, toll free at one eight hundred seven four five six six five five. Yeah, we are talking with Bruce De Palma, who is in New Zealand, uh, as he always is. Uh, he is a citizen down there now. We're sort of laying the background for the reasons why he is in New Zealand. And we're talking about the 1960s and the revolutions that were going on in this country and other places around the world. And Bruce is uh, now into his uh, beginning dissertation about gyroscopes. And uh, when I was a kid, we used to get those as toys, wind a string around them, give them a pull, and they were fascinating. And I guess you as a youngster had the same kind of fascination. Yes. Yes, indeed. And uh, I was never satisfied with the kinds of explanations for what they were supposed to be doing that I was listening to in mm. freshman physics at MIT. Well, let alone what was on the box when you bought one of the little things. I mean, they never told you how they worked. <laughs> well, I don't think anybody really knows how they work. I mean, they know what they do, but why they do what they do, that's a, that's a deep question. But, you know, getting back to simple experiments, uh, when Galileo showed that big objects and, and small objects fell at the same rate, he contradicted the writings of Aristotle, and you know, Aristotle said that uh, the heavy ones should fall faster because they weigh more. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and so the only way that out of this dilemma was uh, for somebody to do the experiment. And of course, the experiment uh, contradicted the dogma. And of course, uh, Galileo was censored uh, for this. But what I'm trying to say is, I did the same thing with the gyroscope. I, you know, you when you were a kid, you hung it on the string and you watched it go around slowly in front of your eyes. Well, my thought was, let's weigh it <laughs> while to it's weigh doing a that. Spinning, weigh a spinning gyroscope. All right. Yeah, yeah, weigh it and see whether it weighs the same when it's spinning around as when it's sitting still. Hmm. <laughs> Good idea. Well, nobody had ever thought of that one. No, and, it's a fascinating idea. <laughs> well, of course, all the all the professors will say it's the air, but it happens to get a little bit lighter, light enough, uh, lighter enough so that you can make up a simple balance out of a meter stick and one gyroscope hanging on one side and a weight hanging on the other. Uh-huh. And if you do the experiment carefully and you spin the gy, you have it balanced with the gyroscope not not uh, spinning, and then you spin it up and hang it back on the same end of the of the meter stick, which has got a string in the middle to make it into a balance. And uh, you'll see as the gyroscope goes around, that end will tilt up because it gets slightly lighter. Now, um, everyone will say it's the air, but I've done the thing in a a box protector from the air, and so I know it gets lighter, and I weighed it on a scale. But what I'm trying to say is here's a simple thing that's right in front of your eyes, but it never occurred to anybody to ever weigh the damn thing while it went around. (laughs) Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, now there's other things you can do too. Uh, if you know that, if you've ever seen a grandfather clock with a big round uh, flywheel on the bottom that just swings back and forth mm-hmm. and goes tick tock, and what would happen if the the round thing on the bottom were spinning <laughs> instead of just just going back and forth? Would it tick tock at the same rate? Well, it happens not to, and no one had ever tried that one either. So there's Boy, are you, old... a, you a troublemaker, Bruce? <laughs> That's oh yes, I, I'm, that goes way back to when I was an undergraduate. Yes, indeed. And uh, <laughs> so there's an old Latin saying that says, uh, "Falso in uno, falsus in omnibus," and that says if there's one thing wrong with a the situation, then everything is probably wrong. So as soon <laughs> as you find something that that is not explainable about a gyroscope, for instance, which is considered to be fully understood then it's open territory <laughs> and so and so then i said well look i don't understand this thing but what happens if i magnetize it then i'll have a magnetized non-understandable object okay <laughs> and then let's see what i can do with that and so i got this idea one afternoon in the meditation that uh, well if 
I had the gyroscope wheel, which is like just a flywheel, just a flat disc of metal, and you magnetize it and make, make one surface north and the other south, like one of those button magnets you stick on a refrigerator to hold a piece of paper on. And then I said to myself, well, okay, if the wheel is going around and the magnetic field is in space and not going around, maybe there will be a voltage between the axle and the outer edge of the wheel. And lo and behold, I mean, I just thought this up. I didn't know that it had ever been tried. Uh, I found out later, <laughs> after I wrote it up, and I said, "This is this is an amazing thing, because I think it'll give energy without slowing down when you take the energy out of it." And somebody said, "Well, you know, Michael Faraday discovered that in 17 no 1831 on December 26th when he tried this experiment." And uh, so I rediscovered something which I was never told in school, and that was that you could take electricity directly out of a rotating magnet. Amazing. And yeah, yeah, it's very, very simple, and it was discovered by Faraday in 1831. And, and so that got me started in the, what I've in, been involved in and why I'm in New Zealand, uh, because it says, <clears throat> now, this is very, very basic and very, very simple. You know that every time somebody puts up a new generating station, either run by steam or gas or coal or atomic, what, is, what, is, what does all the steam and the gas and the coal and the atomic do? What It boils water. And what does the water do? It turns a turbine, which turns a generator. Every time. We have to pause right there. And that's, <laughs> we've got it, no, we've got it all set. I understand. And when we come back, we'll have about three minutes, just so you'll know, until the end of this first hour. So let's sort of recap where we are. Uh, this is remarkable physics, folks, and uh, Bruce De Palma is the man who put it together. Uh, boy, we could get metaphysical about where you got this information, Bruce. Uh, thought it up, or did it come to you? Uh, we'll be back in just a couple minutes with Bruce De Palma here at Sightings on the radio. What a... Sightings on the radio. Call now, toll free at 1-800-745-6655. And we are back with Bruce De Palma, who is uh, telling us some amazing things. Uh, Bruce, you uh, really opened the door there. Go ahead with your story. We've got about three minutes left. And every, again, every power generating station, whether it be fueled by coal, steam, or atomic energy, uh, is there to basically do one thing. That's turn an electric turbine. So go ahead. Well, that's right. They all generate steam, which turns a turbine, which then runs a generator. And all the different combinations and improvements and variations have to do with the way they boil the water. I mean, uh, you either use gas or coal or, coal or oil or you have an atomic reactor, but it all boils the, the water. And, and so... <clears throat> The change, the differences between all these plants have to do with the way that the turbines get the steam from what source of heat they get the steam from. But does anybody ever say, what about the generator? Is this the best generator we could ever make? Is it running, uh, well, I don't know, at 100% efficiency? I mean, the, the fact of the matter is all electrical science is cast in stone. And so what that means is that electrical generators are not to be improved and that the ones we're using now are the best efficiency that electricity can be gotten, period. And so don't waste your time, people. Don't ever think about the fact that you might be able to make a generator better than the ones that Westinghouse or General Electric are making because it's just impossible. And we have all these laws and equations mm -hmm. to tell you that it's impossible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You see, and what I've worked on is a new ways of understanding magnetism and electricity to see whether we could work on the generator part, see, and make that more efficient. Well, that's, that's, what, what, uh, <laughs> that's what Tesla did, wasn't it, to a degree? Well, he, well Tesla, Tesla didn't so much. Tesla invented generators to make alternating current. Right. And then he invented power systems to transmit the the current and uh, he he predicted that at some point he would be able to extract energy from space or the atmosphere he said someday man will attach his wheel work to the very 
uh, his, his machinery to the very wheel work of the universe. And the forces which make the planets rotate and move through space are going to motivate man's engines. And, and he, he predicted that. Whether or not he achieved it, he at least knew it was attainable, you see. And what and, we're talking about, of course, is the legendary zero point, which is where we're going with this discussion uh, right after news. So Tesla really built the uh, the mechanical devices, so to speak. And what uh, Brian uh, Bruce De Palma is doing is, uh, I knew I'd say that. Somebody, <laughs> in case you don't know, Bruce De Palma's brother is Brian De Palma, the uh, motion picture producer of uh, great repute. And uh, they're both very talented folks. But Bruce is the one who uh, who took this idea, and you're trying to refine it and liberate it into a whole new realm of, of what we call commonly the zero point, correct, Bruce? Well, that's what the physicists call it. Uh, I, I, I call it primordial energy, but uh, they're, they're coming from the fossil era, era, and I'm coming from the future, I guess, you know? Well, it's not a bad place to be coming from, as they say. <laughs> Now, you, you put together in the, in the uh, 70s your what they call N machine. Uh, we got about a minute left. Uh, define N for us. Well, that's what N means. N means uh, it's not really definable. It just is sort of uh, to the nth degree. Or Yes, yes. You, I, because when I got this idea and I saw, look, the basic idea is very simple. You can get more electricity out of a magnet directly than you can by moving a wire near a magnet. And so I saw the possibilities of this as being enormous, and so I said, "N, you know." <laughs> and what? Yes. All right. N, and that's uh, we're to the, the nth, nth moment degree. on this hour. <laughs> we'll be right back uh, in about six minutes, Bruce, for hour number two here at Sightings on the Radio tonight with my guest Bruce De Palma, live and direct from New Zealand, and we shall return. The world of the paranormal. UFOs. Alien abductions. Ghosts. Out of body experiences. Past lives. Distant viewing. Government cover ups. Welcome to Sightings on the Radio with your host, Jeff Reddins. You can reach Jeff at 1 800 745 6655. Place your calls now. Here's Jeff. And I hope you were with us for the first hour. Bruce De Palma laid out uh, some pretty remarkable information. Uh, we've gotten to the point now where he has invented what he calls the end machine. And, uh, Bruce, for those who have just joined us, if you could just give us about a minute or two uh, about how this machine works. And uh, we're talking about magnets and what you discovered. Just real quickly, and then we'll move on with the story. Well, um, firstly, um, what you just said, magnets. What? is a magnet and uh, what does a magnet do uh, magnets were discovered by people who found a magnetized uh, mineral called magnetite and then they put it on a string and they uh, discovered that it oriented itself with one end pointing toward the north pole and the other toward the south pole of the earth and was later then later then used as a compass and it was a very magical Phenomena, and uh, you know this kind of a thing was around, and then scientists came along and tried to understand what it did, and came up with the idea of magnetic fields and magnetic lines of force, and so forth and so on. Now they have uh, magnetic mattress pads you sleep on. Yes, and magnetism can affect you uh, in various ways. It can be used to treat uh, illnesses and diseases, and that it's also been discovered that the different uh, magnetic poles, north and south, have different effects. Mm -hmm. So uh, <clears throat> a lot of things have been discovered about magnetism, and so, all right, if you're going to say, well, here is a great basic force in nature, uh, maybe there's some way we can get energy out of it. Now, the old-fashioned way that Faraday also discovered was just to uh, move a wire through a magnetic field, and you move it back and forth, and uh, you get electricity across the ends of the wire. And this is incorporated in every generator that's used on the planet, with rotating drums full of wires and magnets in the in the stator, as they call it, the part that sits still. And the wires go around, and the magnet sits still, and the voltage is developed and comes out uh, through contacts. And Just like uh, in your automobile. 
just like in your automobile and uh, just like in your automobile or in your vacuum cleaner the uh, the opposite is true because they found that if you put electricity into one of these generators uh, it will actually rotate as a motor and so the, mm-hmm. the the generator and the motor action are interchangeable now um, this is all very interesting but as time goes on and people get more scientific about things they start asking questions well is it possible to make a motor that's more of a motor than a generator or a generator that's more of a generator than a motor that doesn't have to have this one-to-one relationship mm-hmm. see and if you could make a generator that was only a generator and not a motor then no matter how much current you took out of it it wouldn't slow down uh, it wouldn't take any extra horsepower from whatever was turning it now uh, maybe that's leaping ahead of uh, ahead of things because you were just talking about the nature of magnetism. But uh, I came up with the idea that the w- reason, you know, when, when you get electricity out of wires moving near magnets, they never tell you where the electricity comes from. They only tell you <laughs> they only tell you that it, it comes from the relative motion of the magnet and the wire. Uh, but they don't say, well, where does it come from? Uh, and I started wondering about where it came from. So, and then I started thinking, well, if it all comes from the same place, maybe there are easier ways to get it than the ones we're using now. Well, I like uh, the way you think. Uh, if it all comes from the same place, <laughs> and it does, apparently. <laughs> it does, it does. All energy comes from the same place. It's obvious, anyway. Uh, so maybe there are easier ways to get it. And so if you make a machine that only has one moving part, as opposed to the ones we use now, which have two moving parts, then there's no possibility of one part dragging against the first, for, you know, what they call drag or Lenz's law or the reason why entropy. things slow. Yeah, or, or entropy or whatever. Uh, the reason why things run down or slow down. If if only one part is available, then there's nothing to slow down in relationship to. Or getting back to the magnetism thing, let's look at magnetism differently. Uh, let's say that magnetism is not coming from the magnet but that whatever the magnet is it's some kind of a material like iron Mm -hmm. which has the the property of distorting a field of energy which is existing around us all the time which we never knew was there you see and the distortion of this primordial energy field is what we know as magnetism oh how interesting yeah i see so when you're taking energy from a wire moving through a distortion created by a magnet, you're not taking energy out of the magnet. You're taking energy out of the field, which is existing around the magnet, which is being distorted by the magnet. And this is why in generators, magnets never run down. They, you can make permanent magnet generators that will run indefinitely, or if you use coils in them, they don't take any more current, no matter how much power you're taking out of the so generator. So let me, let me summarize this in my own mind here. A magnet, a magnetized piece of metal, is not the end in itself. It's simply a conduit, if you will, or a distorting factor for this universal energy field that is everywhere. That's right. That's right. That's right. And that's so simple. And that just and this energy field that we're all swimming around is, is distorted by the magnet. And then we move the wire through the distortion, and we collect the electricity because mm. we know that we can. If you distort something like a spring by compressing it, you you you, you generate pressure. That's voltage. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. see, if you distort space with magnetism, that's electricity. It's it's really simple, and and so the electricity is coming out of space, and so you say, well, how can I get this out without having uh, a slow slow down effect or a drag effect or a meter, well, or a meter? Well, that's Just another being funny angle there. To it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, let's put it this way: the simple fact is, and without all the theories and everything, is that it's it's more effective to take the electricity directly out of a magnet than it is to take it out of a wire moved near a magnet. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this was discovered by actually having to build a big machine to do this, which I did back in in 19, um, when was it, it? 78, 79, in California. And and I happen to be, as you may remember, in Santa Barbara right now. 
I know, I know. And Santa Barbara, California is where it happened. Mm -hmm. But it happened by virtue of the fact that there was a community called Sunburst whose vestiges still exist around Santa Barbara, uh, which was an agricultural, spiritual community, and they were interested in a source of independent energy. And the founder of that community, Norman Paulson, Norman Paulson. that's right, had, uh, had a UFO experience. Now, this sounds fantastic, but this is just as it was related to me by him, that he was driving in his truck one night, and uh, a UFO came overhead and brought him and the truck into the UFO, and the beings on board showed him around and showed him the source of energy on this UFO were rotating magnets. And so through a long combination of circumstances, when De Palma with his rotating magnet generator was brought together with Paulson, who had had the UFO experience, he said, you know, I've seen this before. And uh, we had a little demonstration uh, in one of his barns or shops, and uh, he had his second in command there, a man named Charia Bernard, and uh, who was an electrical engineer, and he said, Bernard, have you ever seen anything like this? And Bernard said, no, because the fact that you can get electricity right out of the magnet itself is not taught because it contradicts the established dogma of electricity. And even though it's a well, <laughs> easy to establish fact, they don't want the students to find out about this because they'll ask too many questions. And, you know, we don't want to have things like that happening in our universities. <laughs> <laughs> you know, amazing story. This is amazing. Because Norm Paulson is really a character, as you well know, and I, uh, I, I, I vaguely knew, or I interviewed him once for television when I was a kid, and uh, I was up on the uh, location you're talking about uh, at that point in time, and uh, it's just amazing what happened uh, and the circumstance of you coming in uh, to Norm's life and vice versa and his, uh, his purported experience uh, all syncing up. That's right. And you see, of course, the only reason, I can't say the only reason, because we think reason is the only way of analyzing situations. And... I mean, reason is the fossilized way of doing it. We, we would say now, in, in the New Age, you would say karma or fate or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, but every industrial or, or any kind of uh, uh, entrepreneurial outfit in Santa Barbara had turned me down with this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. Hold on, Bruce. Right there. We have to pause again. It's time for our, uh, to honor our sponsors, and we shall do so and be back. In about three minutes with my guest, Bruce De Palma, live from New Zealand tonight at Sightings on the Radio. You're listening to Sightings on the Radio. And we are back with Bruce De Palma. So you've got this brilliant breakthrough, this uh, serendipitous event, so to speak, with uh, Paulson's input. You've got no backers in the mainstream of all the uh, area business people. So what happened? Well, I want to point out uh, at uh, this point uh, that the reason uh, I didn't get any backers in the mainstream business people was not because the project wasn't attractive to them or they didn't get excited over it. What happened was when it reached the higher levels of whatever it was reaching, they all decided uh, individually but uh, collectively that uh, it was too big a project and they couldn't control it. And so if they couldn't control it, they didn't want to get involved with it because it was sure. so simple. Everybody would run with it. Well, it's that De Palma kid causing trouble again. Right. But this is where I want to, I want to sort of get into a different angle on this whole thing. Um, I want to start talking about the difference between first-rate scientists and, and second-raters or third-raters and the Internet and its relationship to this and the end machine, and it mm -hmm. goes something like this, that um, for the first time in history, the Internet makes it possible for a scientist to put out information about what he's doing without having to go through the censorship of uh, peer review groups and physical reviews and this, that, and the next thing. And, of course, somebody will say, well, that means just anything can go out there, and that's true. Anything is out there. And you have to use your discrimination, that is, the people who are browsing all this information to see what's 
what appeals to them or not, but at least you have a voice. Before, you had no voice at all. Oh, I agree, Bruce. You, what we're sitting on here is the liberation of true scientific endeavor. That's right. And you see, the second raiders or the third raiders will agree to sign a secrecy agreement and work on disassembling flying saucers and back engineering anti-gravity machines for, for whoever, you know, EG&G, the company whose president I was the assistant to, is the company that manages all that research. You've seen, even after 17 years of association with Dr. Edgerton, I knew not a thing about what the company was really doing. Is so, that right? That, Amazing. Yeah. I was in the same office with this man. You see, and he, 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 led, he led a, del, a double life as a professor at MIT and as the president of that company. So that, that's another subject we can dip in maybe a little bit later. But I just want to say that the reason that I'm in New Zealand is because uh, this – in the United States and, and, and highly industrialized countries, of course, the scientific establishment is very much funded by big industry and government. And uh, the first place people look for money is the government and so forth, and this allows – the governments of various countries to control the direction of scientific research through where they put their money. And so if you don't, and who's controlling the government? Of course, it's the military industrial complex. And of course, the aims of whatever these people are generally, you know, wind up in the form of some doctor doing some weapon on some plasma beam or ball lightning, which is they're doing in Australia. Primarily, I suspect, because it's so far away from everything else that nobody thinks anybody will notice except the that, people. That's right, yeah. yeah. We, we've had Ross Dow on the show. You know Ross? Uh, he does a lot of good research. They, he said that they now have over 8,000, at least, reports of these plasma balls down there. That's right. So, so in some part of the world, you know, the British used to send the criminals here. Well, now they, they send the fireballs here, see? So, <laughs> well, you laugh, but I'm down here. <laughs> All right, but, but let's get back to this whole business about science and so forth and so forth, that, that the scientists, if they really were what they pretend to be, would be open-minded and they would, they would embrace new information because the fact that, just the simple fact that magnetism is not coming from a magnet is a distortion of a pre-existent primordial field is so momentous an idea It'll change everything we know about liberating energy. And you see, just to, to look at that as a threat where, when we're in a world where the population is 5.4 billion heading toward 10 billion in 20, 20, 2010, you know, and, and where we have, uh, we're running out of food and everything, for people to sit on their duffs and say, well, if it, if, if it doesn't go along with Newton's laws or Einstein's principles or Maxwell's equations, it can't be true. This is a terribly self-destructive uh, a- attitude, and you see, uh, the reason that I'm here in New Zealand is because this is a growing part of the world. This is, we don't have a military-industrial complex. We don't, we're not, as New Zealanders, we're not interested in <laughs> world domination. We may, we may want to sell uh, sheep <laughs> or lamb somewhere, or you may want a sweater or a seat cover, but, I mean, that's about as far as it goes. And, and uh, kiwi fruit, fine. And, uh, we, you know, you can have a mussel. We have lots of mussels down here. <laughs> 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 so, so this is where – but why shouldn't every country in the world be like this? We're happy. And, and the thing is, if people could get out of their heads the, the ideas of, you know, power and domination and control and all that stuff uh, – you know, we could get along on this planet and tackle the problems of getting along on this problem uh, on how, this planet. Yeah. How, how, yes, Bruce, quite right. And uh, here, here, as they say in merry old England, how is it that the scientific community has gotten to be so co-opted, uh, enslaved, and trained, and chained, and enmeshed with the money, corporate, multinational structure? that it's almost useless. I mean, honestly, aside from the Internet now, it is so stodgy and so stilted and so stultified in its efforts to move forward with new frontiers of vision and wisdom to make the world safer and a better place. 
Uh, it's silly. I don't understand how science has become, at this late stage in the game, to be held still in such high repute by so many people, because obviously, I guess they just don't know any better, but it is really in bondage, and let's be honest about it. Well, you're, you're, you are being honest about it, what I say, and I've got my own radio show I've got to do in, in three hours here in, mm. in New Zealand, is, you know, if the science that we have is so powerful, okay, give me a cure to AIDS, you know, help me get rid of the radioactivity. Find well, me a lot of people th- would say, you know, forget <laughs> the cure, they gave us AIDS. Well, all right, okay, but but whatever can be given can be taken away, you know. He who giveth can also take, away, take it back. Of course. Of course. And, and, right. And so, and so, all right, this, these things can happen, but the fact of the matter is we put all this money in, in, in these, you know, the, look at the Mars thing that's happening right now. Have we put, you know, billions of dollars, that, that was, was $247 million, but it followed two failures, each one of which was worth a billion or so. Uh, and what do we wind up with is some tinker toy rolling back and forth, taking pictures of different rocks with interesting names. Now, uh, I don't know. I, somehow I feel that, that, that man, that our species, is something, is do something greater than this. Uh, what I'd like to hear coming back from Mars is how suitable is it for colonization? Could we have a base there? Uh, have I, I haven't heard a word about anything like that. Well, don't you suspect, Bruce, that maybe those words are being uh, talked about behind closed doors, so to speak? Well, maybe they are, but who's paying for it? Well, of course. Yeah. I am. You're not. You got out. <laughs> well, I got out, but the thing is, uh, I'm, I'm talking to Americans right now, and they ought to wake up and say, look, I want something for my money. Well, this and, brings uh, us back to your point about the Internet, I think. Yeah. And so the Internet really allows, allows us to, uh, to communicate uh, beyond the boundaries of, of censorship. But, all right, let's get back to electrical energy again. And, and what I, I guess basically what I'm saying is, yes, I, I can give you all kinds of scientific and physical ideas about where the energy is coming from and how it's coming from space and so forth and so on. But, but, but what it really boils down to is you can get more energy out of a magnet than by moving a wire near a magnet. Amazing. All right, hold on right there. We have another short time out, and we'll come right back and uh, talk with uh, Bruce De Palma about the incredible world of magnets here at Sightings on the radio. And again, if you uh, tuned in late, the key issue to understanding uh, much of this discussion lies in the simple fact that Bruce De Palma discovered that magnets are not an end in and of themselves. They are simply, essentially, a conduit. They distort unlimited energy that is uh, flowing, apparently, throughout the universe and bring it through themselves, as it were. And Bruce has found a way to extract energy from this magnetic field that does not, remember, emanate from the piece of metal itself, but is coming through that metal by way of distortion. Go ahead, Mr. De Palma. Well, I just, uh, this sounds, you know, kind of complicated, but uh, I guess guess you just have to take it as it comes. I just... I think so. (laughs) I just... uh, I just want to say that I'm not the only one in the world that uh, came up with this. Uh, not only did Faraday discover it, but during the same times when I was performing my experiments in Santa Barbara uh, and with the first really big end machine built, a big rotating magnet, you know, 12 inches in diameter, something substantial. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was an Indian scientist, uh, a member of the Indian Nuclear Power Board, uh, a man named Paramahamsa Tiwari, who had developed a theory of space and matter. And uh, this theory of his predicted that you could extract uh, energy directly from space. And somehow uh, somebody put me into contact with him, and I sent him the results of my experiments. And uh, to put it in his words now, he said after he received this information, he was so shocked uh, that he, he the, my experiments proved his theory, but he was so shocked by what he saw that he was afraid to do anything about it for a fortnight. And then hmm. he tried it out, and it worked. Hmm. 
Wow. Now, now you have to understand about physicists, even if they come up with a great theory and they think it's all wonderful, when the experiment arrives on their doorstep that will either prove or disprove them, they're somewhat hesitant to do it because they know that if it works, everything's cool. But if it doesn't work, well, <laughs> it's all down the drain, you know. Mm-hmm. Sure. So, so, so even if even if you've predicted that uh, you've got something better than sliced bread, you may not be ready to turn on the machine. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So anyway, Tawari um, started building end machines on his own and verified the fact that that you could get three or four times more power out of these things than you had to put in to turn them. And he and I, through the years, have gone through a process of experiment on experiment on experiment to develop the proper configuration to get the most power for the least amount of work. And the the reason we had to do this is because we're working in an area which is not theoretically predictable. It's not understood. We're in the same position that Edison was in when he was looking for the light bulb filament. He just had to try 40,000 different little fibers, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what people don't realize. They think that science is all a bunch of equations and theories and things, but when it really comes down to it, uh, it's not like that at all. You you come upon something and then you try to make it, you know, you try to emphasize the effect. Uh, Hey, Bruce, you've got it to a 3 to 4 to 1 ratio now. Are you suggesting to me that uh, through X number of experiments and configurations, you may step across a threshold which leads you to a massive breakthrough where you might get 10, 20 to 1, something like that? Well, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> it, we, I don't know whether we're going to get up uh, quite as high as that. I thought the direction you were going to lead us into was the one where, well, Bruce, uh, if you can get that much more power out than you've got to put in, then why not make it run itself? Well, you that's a pretty. That sort of goes without saying. I would think that would be part of the, the beauty of the package. Well, it's it's a possibility. You see, this is a very interesting thing. Um, you know, when when Edison was doing the light bulb, uh, everybody knew you could make a wire glow if you put electricity through it in a bulb somehow. The trick was to see if you could make it glow for fifty or a hundred hours. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't too expensive that other people couldn't couldn't own it. Now, if it was platinum wire, in some size, you know, some sort of special setup, it, nobody could afford it. So you had to go through all these experiments to make something practical, which people could afford. And we've, that is, Tuari and I, have gone through all these experiments to find out how to maximize the effect of this machine. And the very latest ones, which took place uh, in the last couple of years, which are all on my website and, and all the papers are put out there, because this is another facet of the Internet thing. Uh, we discovered something which you can do with this electrical machine that is an end machine, which you can't do with any other electrical generator, and that is you can, you can compensate it. The compensation means you can make, for every current carrying conductor with the currents going in one direction, you can put right next to it a current carrying conductor with the current going in the opposite direction. And what this means is is that no matter how much power you take out of one of these machines, nothing changes within the machine. And if nothing changes within the machine, then the drag doesn't change either. Mm-hmm. And this compensation idea was worked out by Tuari and I a couple of years ago. It was the final thing we needed to know in order to bring the gain up you know, from like two to one or one and a half to one up to three or four to one, which starts to get very... uh, Very attractive. Yeah, very attractive. And so we've worked hard, and now uh, I'm, you know, things are at the point... This gets back to the Internet, you see, because as a scientist, what I'm interested in doing is to have these ideas out in the world. So every time I come up with an idea like this, I put it on my website. I don't file a patent. I don't try to bury it. I don't try to secrefy it so that nobody can find out. A first-rate scientist wants the world to know what he's doing because first-rate scientists and inventors are interested in solving the problems of the world. That's, I mean, that's what we're here to do. We don't, a first-rate inventor will not work on something useless 
you know. He works on a light bulb. He'll work on a plastic. He'll work on a glue. That's something useful for society. That's what made Edison such a such a such a you know wonderful person because he worked on things that helped people in their every day to day life. The doctors don't work on curing diseases that don't exist. They work on things that are right in front of us that we can get our hands on. So, for all of us scientists, all of us technical people, we want to attack the problems which confront society. And if governments and corporations and secrecy agreements and patents want to tie us up, there's a few of us, me included, that'll just get away from wherever I'm being tied up to a point where I can talk. And that's why I'm in New Zealand and you're still in, in Santa Barbara, you know. But for but, some uh, wonderful reason, you're able to still talk over here. Yeah, for, for some, yeah. And I think that that has to do with, the, with this connectivity thing. And that that uh, the connectivity of the globe through the internet and through communications is overcoming the secrecy. We have to become a global society. We're living on a planet. It's not. It's a spaceship. It's got a finite area. It's it's like a big ship like the Queen Mary. You know, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. It's got a bilge mm-hmm. and it's got got uh, first class quarters and, and all sorts of places in between. An engine sure. room. See? And, so and, and the whole idea of a uh, a one world government, one world order, isn't such a bad idea. It's a necessary part of the evolution if we're going to survive here. It's who's at the controls of it all that worries people. Well, let's put it this way: I don't I don't go for one world governments or one world orders because I think that 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 there's a different kind of unity that can take place. We can have a cultural unity. We can have. Uh, uh, a love unity. We can have a moral unity. We can have a spiritual unity. We don't have to all have the same government or the same currency. And a, a scientific unity as well. Yeah, and a scientific unity. But I don't need somebody in some central place telling me what to do. That's I, what I thought. I didn't think that's what you meant. Okay. No, I don't. All right, hold on. We have to pause, and we'll come back with Bruce De Palma here. Amazing conversation tonight at Sightings on the Radio. I'm Jeff Rents. You're listening to this program, as always, on the Premier Radio Networks. You're listening to Sightings on the Radio. And uh, we're back. Uh, So, Bruce, uh, as I've said for years, we don't have to surrender our national identity or or sovereignty at all. But as you eloquently phrased it, we simply need to participate in a a global unity on a number of different levels, which uh, certainly seems to be a a confederacy that uh, most everyone should be able to live with. Well, I think that is, you know, look at look at. The, what's going on, say, for, for instance, with the European Monetary Union, just, as, just at the point where they're deciding that we're just going to have one common currency, everybody gets cold feet and pulls back. It's because there's a certain national pride in having your own coins and your own paper with the, you know, the pictures of the king and queen or Jefferson and Washington or whoever you want to put on it. And there's a certain identity that people need. You, oh, we're talking think, about a thousand years of, of history in many cases. People are uh, asked to, uh, you know, in some ways give up. That's right. You've hit it exactly. As soon as you let go of your history, you're nothing. And so you want to want to re- retain your traditions, your history, and your culture. And there's, I, I can't imagine how there can't be a way. I mean, there has to be a way. There is a way for a confederation of different countries to get along on this planet and we just have to get out of this thing about, well, look, you know, you can talk a lot about what we have to do, but suppose we just have something which just takes the pressure off. Now, if we had a source of energy which, number one, didn't create any pollution, and number two, uh, didn't use up anything, uh, this would help a lot. It would take a lot of the heat off. It would take off the, the strain, say, for instance, in the Middle East and, and worries about oil and who's going to get it and, and fights and stuff like that. Uh, this is, an, is very, very important. And I, I hope that this radio program and uh, whoever I'm speaking to tonight, uh, uh, this afternoon here in New Zealand, uh, sort of picks up on this, is that uh, there's a basic 
thing involved here. Uh, it's energy, and uh, the speed limit is being set by the electrical engineers who would say that they can't make their generators any better than they can. We're about to see a whole new era of generators, aren't we? We're going to lose our, our traditional generators sooner or later to something very much like you have developed. Well, that's right. It has to get better. If you think about what it takes to put in a new power unit of any kind, you've got to get all the people around there to give environmental approvals. You have to make sure that you're treating the smog and the pollution coming out of this so it doesn't poison anything. And what it turns out to be, by the time you get approval, years and years have gone by, millions and millions of dollars have been spent. And so... If somebody says to you, if you're a power company and says, look, you don't have to expand your plant, you don't have to burn any more fuel, just improve the generator and you can double the power out. But I cannot imagine, <laughs> I cannot imagine why people don't want to, can't see this and, and don't want to go for it. I just think that uh, the electrical power industry is the most fossilized, and of course, next to the uh, oil industry in the that world. That was a very good pun, by the way. <laughs> it is, it is. You know, if you want to see an antique museum, just drive up and down the highway and look at the power poles and transformers and the wires. Oh, they're so ugly. Yeah, you're right. Well, right. It hasn't changed since 1900, and that's because it's a monopoly, and there's a meter on your house, and, you know, you, they talk about the mafia and the shakedowns and so forth. This is better than the mafia on a shakedown. <laughs> I mean, uh, if you if you don't pay your bill, you don't get electricity. And if you don't get electricity, you freeze to death, you see. So you have very little choice. And so this kind of monopoly attitude goes all the way through the management and the technical work and everything else. How close you, are we, Bruce? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, that's all right. You got it. How close are we to getting uh, a new era of electrical generators uh, here. Look, you know, what's really interesting about all this is the fact that the U.S. Navy has been working on this system of electrical power since the mid-'80s. In, in 1993, they decreed that no ship built by the Navy after that time was going to be anything else but electrical, electrically powered by the kinds of generators that I'm talking about, homopolar generators and machines. Has anybody heard about this? Does anybody know? No. And this is what I, what I question. If all this, they spent billions of dollars on this project, why is the effort going into military applications of this idea and none of it coming down to the poor people who have to struggle every day to get to work and buy food carried by, you know, whatever mover it takes that uses fossil fuels? All the cost of transportation could be reduced. You see, if we, we got our energy in a different way. But, but the way the world is going now, the, the people working on it are thinking about it in terms of military applications. And that's maybe, hmm. you know... Uh, there we go about. again. Uh, trickle down <laughs> microwave ovens is what we get after they do all this Star Wars business. And it's they, funny how, how it works. Yeah, and Velcro is what we do after they make the spacesuits and eat. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, you laugh, but it's true, you it's see. It's very true. It's very, very true. And think of all those things that came spiraling out of that uh, big 1960s push to get to the moon and so forth uh, that uh, came our way courtesy of Lytton and the other country companies. It, it's amazing. We're going to pause again, Bruce, and come back. And about three minutes left in the second hour. And during the third hour, I'd love to get into the, uh, the ideas and the knowledge you have about uh, what's really possibly going on by way of back engineering and working on captured uh, extraterrestrial craft that uh, may well have been going on for a long time now. Right uh, here and uh, back in three minutes with Bruce DePalm at Sightings on the radio. You're listening to Sightings on the radio. Your calls are welcome at 1-800-745-6655. And we're back with Bruce De Palma here for a couple of minutes here in our second hour and then uh, third hour opening up right after news. So we're looking now already at the hallowed halls of the defense establishment beginning to adopt the basic concepts that you pioneered over 20 years ago, correct? Yep. And uh, trickle-down will be our ultimate salvation. 
as they say. Or ultimate destruction. One uh, or the other. Uh, that's right. And, um, you know, it may well be that through radio programs like this, that we're eroding this um, barrier of silence. I mean, uh, you consider the Roswell incident. There's been so much publicity and so much debunking of Air Force uh, explanations about dummies and weather balloons and everything else that the whole thing has gotten totally ridiculous. At some point, somebody's going to open a file somewhere and we'll find out what's truly going on, because it's not going to make any difference, you see. And the reason it's not going to make any difference is because you and I and others like you have been talking this stuff up for years and years and years and years and years and years. And years. If we hadn't, maybe the situation wouldn't come about. Right. But... There, there, yeah, there comes a point where saturation is reached uh, quietly, unnoticed, and it, then everything becomes a fait accompli when it's announced, correct? That's exactly right, and that's what I think we're, we're leading up to. So, um, th this is a whole topic. You know, you wanted to uh, to get into the back engineering, uh, so forth and so on, and I, I I'll, I'll talk to you about that. But I'd sort of like to give you the thought that, you know, I'm a guy that's for free enterprise and small businesses and the success of the little guy. Because I was a little guy, and uh, you know, I tried to make my way into the physics establishment. And the thing is, you find out how the cards are stacked against you. But you know, if you're an industrialist of any kind that wants to go anywhere in the electronics business, how does it feel that you've, you're dealing with companies that are taking apart alien flying saucers and finding out how they work? And instead of having to do the hard R and D work, all they do is have to duplicate some chip or some piece they get out of some flying saucer while mm -hmm. the poor little guy in the bottom has to figure it all out from scratch. I mean, that's the way I feel about what I've done with free energy and anti-gravity. I have to figure it out from scratch, but in Area 51, in an EG&G special projects laboratory there, it's sitting right there on the table, you see, and, and it's a very strange feeling. Uh, it's uh, got a, yeah a very complex feeling, I'm sure, emotionally, intellectually, and, and the works. Oh, it is, it is, it is. You know, when Edison was making the light bulb, he he wasn't watching watching trains with light bulbs in them going by. He was completely in the dark. He brought it into mm -hmm. existence from nothing. Mm -hmm. But I know that there are anti gravity vehicles. They're, they're they're all around us. You know, I know that there are ways of getting energy without pollution or smog. That's what powers these things. And here they are. And so here, to try and what we're doing as human beings is we're trying to figure out how all this stuff works from basic principles while we're surrounded with the artifacts of races that have already solved these problems. Very, very, very provocative things to think about. We're going to break for news uh, about six minutes and come back with hour number three. And if you'd like to call in and talk to uh, Bruce De Palma, who is on the phone live from his home in uh, New Zealand, you're certainly welcome to 1-800-745-6655. We're going to break now and come back with our number three of sightings on the radio. of the paranormal UFOs alien abductions ghosts out of body experiences past lives distant viewing government cover ups welcome to sightings on the radio with your host Jeff Reds you can reach Jeff at 1-800-745-6655 place your calls now here's Jeff Hope you've uh, been with us tonight. It's been my uh, great pleasure to have Bruce De Palma on as a guest. We've got one more hour to go. Bruce, what is your website URL, please? Yes, my website is www.depalma.org.nz. www.depalma.org.nz. Got it. Have you uh, come across read or seen Colonel Philip Corso's book, The Day After Roswell? 
I have not gotten the book here yet, but I have read uh, reviews of it and uh, from CNI News, uh, Michael Lindemann's UFO sure. News letter. <clears throat> Michael, uh, by the way, is on every Wednesday here. He's uh, our regular in my weekday uh Wednesday night, uh, expert in the whole field, and uh, happy to have him here. Yes, he's got a very valuable newsletter. Well, the, the point that, that uh, I would like to, to throw out to the listeners out there at this point is um, I'm for free enterprise. I'm, you know, people have, have uh, looked at me, and they call me an all-American boy or a Jeffersonian Democrat or something like that, you know. But whatever it is, businesses have to have a certain amount of privacy in order to operate. And if intelligence agencies are listening to all of their conversations, reading their faxes, their business mail, and have access to their bank records through tapping the satellite transmissions, uh, you know, what, how can anybody operate a competitive business if people can, can have access to all of their records? Can it do? Right. And the other side of it is, is how can any company, uh, how can any man who wants to get into some leading edge business compete against people who are disassembling flying saucers and passing the information to their own engineers? Uh, Brings a lot of uh, questions about antitrust and proprietary rights, doesn't it? Well, exactly right. I think these things go to the basis of the Constitution of the United States and, and why people live there, because of the, they, they expect to have a certain amount of privacy to conduct their business in. And, you know, you can talk about morality and truth and perception, but let's just stick with business, and uh, which is a very definite, uh, definable area. And the thing is, confidence has to be maintained in business transactions. And with everybody spying... And at the spot, who, <clears throat> for instance, in New Zealand, uh, there part of this listening post here is a part of the New Zealand intelli secret uh, intelligence service, and mm -hmm. part of the information that they pick up on these uh, satellite dishes off the Intel Sat satellites goes to New Zealand. And the, I was on, I, on my radio show here. I put it out. I said, "Look," I said. Uh, you're trying to operate a business in New Zealand or do business with any of the countries around here, like Indonesia or Japan or China, all of whom are very much involved, Australia, with New Zealand, and somebody's reading your mail. I mean, what, how does that make you feel? And the thing is, now in the papers here, there's a, an agency that's been appointed to, to supervise the spies and make sure that the information they collect is, is privy knowledge. It's not circulated. It's, you know... Oh, are this, you talking about morality among spies here? Well, it's just good business. <laughs> it's, Interesting. You can't, you can't carry on business without, without some kind of confidentiality. And no, furthermore, right. And furthermore, if, 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 how can people think of us here in New Zealand if they think we're reading their mail? Do they trust us or like us even? You see, so to get back to the to the good old days, <clears throat> well, I don't know whether they were good because we just looked at them through the telescope of the past. But you know, when people didn't read each other's mail and and uh, a handshake was a deal, and so yeah. Well, now it almost seems now, Bruce, that uh, lying is the lubricant of commerce. Uh, no one uh, hesitates, for the most part, uh, to lie or to twist or corrupt or to shade. Uh, and then there are lies of omission. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty treacherous world out there. We've got Ed on the phone calling in, wants to talk to you from Jacksonville, Florida, listening in uh, on WJGR. Hello, Ed. You're on the air with Bruce De Palma. Hi, uh, Bruce and Jeff. Uh, uh, I don't listen to your shows that often, but uh, what y'all were talking about tonight is very interesting because uh, back in the 70s when... Uh, we were having a bunch of problems energy-wise. Uh, the alleged oil shortage. Yes, sir. Uh, basically, uh, I was trying to come up with some ideas to help mankind also, and uh, I prayed to, to the Lord. I am a Christian. But anyway, it came to me that uh, a possible solution uh, to the oil shortage, we could use magnets uh, to prepare 
tell one another, and I, I've done a lot of research in it and things like that, and come to find out it's exactly what Bruce is saying. Uh, the, the type of uh, materials I needed to actually do the experimentation, I, I couldn't really get my hands on. I couldn't get the information I needed. Right. Uh, it, it's very difficult. Uh, anyway, uh, I have done a little bit of preliminary research into the into it, and uh, uh, another thing that is really funny is how a lot of the major companies like NASA uh, has technology that could definitely be useful because I was looking into wind turbines, and uh, NASA has evidently something with like 103 to 1 gear ratio that drives these big term turbines out in the west for i don't know if you're familiar with it yeah it's yeah let me uh, ed let me ask you to uh, hold on right there we're getting a little bit out there nasa of course is not a, a company but a, a public agency as we all know and uh, let me pitch this back over to bruce now and thank you very much for the call and uh, the fact that you've been doing some work with magnets i'm glad you heard the program tonight because not many people know about any of this and uh, to, so hang on there bruce how about this well, you see, this is a, uh, a very basic thing. See, I feel that when the human race gets itself into a corner and is really up against something, that the solution or answer, which is necessary for the survival of the human race, is built into our genome or our genetic process. And somehow, you talk about magnets, gyroscopes, this triggers off something in people they listen they're interested it's a fascination and when i explain that my generator is a magnetized gyroscope and i say i just spin this wheel and i get the voltage here and here uh, people look at me and they they get it they understand it they see it in a flash and i i i basically believe it's not a question of so much a communication but that this solution has been available within us and when the heat was really on, I'm not talking about the heat that we hear on television or what people are telling us about the problems of the world. I mean, the, the things that are really wrong in this world, people don't talk about. They don't talk about overpopulation. They don't talk about decreasing supplies of oxygen. They don't talk about resource wars over oil. Oh, no, no, no. We will talk about, you know, little disturbances here and there. Um, so... We know in our subconscious that we're up against something horrendous, and so something tremendous has to come to balance it. And this magnet thing, I have had many, many people come to me and say, I've been thinking about magnets all my life. I know that there's a source of energy in magnets. It has something to do with magnets. And I, I tell all of you out there, you are right. It does have something to do with magnets and what magnets are. And this very ancient force of magnetism that the scientists will say, oh, we know everything there is to know about it. Baloney. We don't know the first thing about it. And it's a source of energy. And if we can use it to get ourselves out of this ecological hole we've dug ourselves into, then we should. And it doesn't make any difference whether somebody's going to, you know, have their reputation ruffled or this, that, or the next thing. I'm just thinking about all the people that can go back to work, all the people that can be warm at night, and all the people that can be fed from the energy which you can get without creating more pollution, which is the only way, the only way we're ever going to, uh, we're, we're ever going to survive on this planet. I mean, we're looking, we're looking at racial extinction in terms of overpopulation and consumption of all natural resources. It's as if the warehouse of the world, all of the goods are being sold at a fire sale, and nobody knows what's going to happen when they run out. Yeah, and exactly right. Uh, we have to pause again. Uh, Ed, thank you very much for the call and for listening in in Jacksonville at WJGR. And we'll be back with Bruce De Palma here at Sightings on the Radio. Boy, and you think, Bruce, uh, that they've mapped, allegedly, the entire human genome. And, boy, if they start playing around with that... Uh, all bets are off. We're going to be back with Bruce De Palma in a couple of minutes. And we're back talking with Bruce De Palma. All right, Bruce, let's talk about anti-gravity propulsion. Uh, we've talked about energy and so forth. 
uh, give us a thumbnail sketch of how that works. And uh, again, you're, <laughs> you have, you have, just being a little facetious here, but you have no doubt in your mind that uh, this hardware has in fact been uh, acquired, I'm going to put quotes around that word, a long time ago and has been, uh, been given a very good going over by the best scientists that our intelligence community and military can muster, in their opinion, to try to uh, take these things apart and figure them out, correct? Well, right, and they came up with uh, Bob Lazar, and uh, who's an MIT PhD in physics, and uh, <clears throat> loaded up with all the theories that MIT PhD in physics, uh, PhDs in physics, have to learn, understand, memorize, and be examined on. Uh, he examined the uh, saucer propulsion, and uh, because of all of these. Uh, what you could you could call them schemes or blinders or theories uh, i you know i don't think that he really got the message about what he was looking at because anti gravity and the understanding thereof has to come from a different way of seeing physical phenomena now, i mean uh, look you're talking about a paradigm shift and i'm trying to describe a paradigm shift and neither one of these things is possible we we just go from one age into another uh, at, at one time in, in, in life, we thought certain things were important, and then, then things shifted, and, and now we think certain other things are important. For instance, uh, right now it's important that uh, we have enough money to go out and buy enough food to eat. Now, suppose somebody made an invention, which was a, you might call a three-dimensional version of a Xerox machine, and a Xerox machine with a tray on one side and a tray on the other and you drop one apple in the tray on the in basket and press 10 and 10 apples appear on the tray in the out basket okay now i think this is a perfectly possible machine but think about what that does to our society <laughs> do i have to it's, draw it, you no diagram? you don't no that's uh, <laughs> yeah that's what some people would call utopia well, it's a utopia of a kind, but it just it just it's it gets rid of one problem but sets up a lot of others. Then people sit around eating apples all the time and get bored. Now now what are they going to do, you see? Formerly they might have had a job. So so each each step forward has its consequences which sort of takes you to another threshold and you, you never you never really know. Like for instance, if we had an energy machine that is an end machine or something like it, which could give us energy without pollution, uh, that would mean we could solve a lot of our problems uh, around us. We could clean up a lot of waste dumps and stuff and, and burn up a lot of garbage and keep ourselves warm and we wouldn't have to build any more atomic plants or hydro plants or anything, but we still wouldn't have had solved the problem of how to get along, you see. And we still wouldn't have gotten the people who are on the power trips that want to own the world off their power trips. And you see, it just, it just like one step goes on to the next. And so, it's true. It's true. Um, can I jump? We're running short on time here. I've got so many ahead. things I want to ask you. But uh, when you look up and see these plasma fireballs, they call them Zeus fire uh, orbs of light, I, what are your thoughts? I mean, do you know in, inherently that these are manifestations of, of our technology, or do you have any concerns about them being uh, something else? You're, you're pretty well convinced that we're doing this, correct? Well, uh, they ask the aborigines in those areas whether there's any racial memory of anything like that ever happening, and they mm -hmm. say no. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been an earthquake in this area before? No. <laughs> And and there's a there's a there's a question in front of the Australian Parliament right now about the, these earthquakes were detected at these stations. They never occurred before. What's the explanation? And also the involvement of this um, crazy cult from Japan in there and some something. And uh, who knows? But like I said earlier, and like you you said as well, it's it's a it's probably the mo one of the most remote regions in the planet. And it's it's also accessible to the Americans, and uh, things that can be set off can probably be set off there and observed. Uh, you know, 
without bothering too many people. And, and, uh, but my question is, why, why are we doing this? I mean, we have so many other problems in this world to solve. Why do we go on with this stupidity, you see? With, with respect to the sighting of uh, craft, unidentified flying objects, you're also convinced that a lot of those machines are being possibly operated by us, uh, maybe even built by us, uh, and then a lot of them aren't. We've got a well, mix up there, right? Well, I don't know whether this is the standard doctrine, but I more or less <clears throat> have become convinced that uh, some sort of deal has been struck between uh, the U.S. government and uh, whatever there's the majority alien group or something, and something's going on. There's some mm-hmm. collaboration taking place. Uh, for what purpose, I don't know. For what reason, I don't know. But I do know this, that the universe is an old, old place. <clears throat> the, 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 the more modern occurrence is the human race. The aliens have been around forever. And so uh, there, there's a reason for them being here. This may be a base of some sort. Maybe they just want to get on and get off and not be bothered. Maybe there are other experiments going on here. This is in itself, you know, you talk about the Australian outback <clears throat> for, for the plasma ball experiments. Look at Earth in relationship to the center of our own galaxy. We're a zillion miles from the center. We're way out in the boondocks. Things are being tried here, which maybe they wouldn't want to try closer to home, being that the, you know, these intelligent races inhabiting the galaxy have been around and have been so around. We're the Australian outback of our galaxy. Yes, up obviously we are. Oh, interesting. Has there been any direct contact made by you with any sources you trust beside uh, Mr. Edgerton at EG&G, which would lead you to believe that uh, we are in some kind of uh, de facto collusionary status with uh, aliens, or is this just a, a hunch on your part? Well, you know, you and I... Um uh, we're we're just we're like crawling around in in a dark room. It's the old elephant in the dark problem. We're feeling around in the dark, and we're trying to make inferences about something we don't know about, or which is being withheld from us on the basis of of, of the lack of information in certain areas. And we say, well, there's nothing in in we, we I haven't heard anything about the end machine or free energy. Well, that sounds strange to me because uh, we know there's a lot of this work going on. Well, what does that mean? You know, so what I'm what I'm being what I'm sensing about this whole situation is whoever is operating this world or controlling what goes on has reached a point where it doesn't really make any difference what citizens believe or what they vote for or what they pay for anymore. They go on more or less independently, and the fa- the very fact that that nothing on a, on a grand scale is being done about this pollution or food problem or even to make people aware of it in, in, other than just sort of a bunch of hand wringing is very suspicious to me. It's as if people 60 years ago had decided, or in the 50s, say. And they, but this is another one of those scenarios. It's the alternative three scenario where the people who really knew what was happening had all the mm-hmm. reports got together and realized there was no way out and so there had to be another alternative and that was the moon base and the mars base and that everything would just run along until it ran out and then boom and you can justify the build-up and military activity on that basis now what can i say yeah okay we're going to pause again uh and it's it's pretty hard to imagine that 60 years ago people didn't know where things were headed at least in a fairly general way we'll be right back with Bruce De Palma here in a couple of minutes Uh, Bruce, are you there? Yep. Good. All right, we are here. We had uh, a, a, a tolerable interruption compared to the last time we tried to do a show, so we are back. All how right. many How many of those things uh, that, that we see 
uh, flying around up there. Uh, would you say are ours? This is kind of a silly guessing game, but we've done it before on this program. But a small percentage, a large percentage, and we have so many different shape of craft too being reported all over the world. It's uh, it really leads one to the almost inescapable conclusion that we are being visited, perhaps by a number of different groups of uh, people. Well, look, Jeff, uh, what would you do? Uh, here you're the strongest power in the galaxy, <clears throat> let's say you, the United States of Earth, and uh, you're going to humor a lesser power like Egypt, for instance, and so you mm -hmm. sell them your low-grade fighter planes and obsolete stuff that you phased out 20 or 30 years ago, and and you know that if they ever try to do anything you know, funny, you could blow them all away, and you just humor them. <laughs> uh, if I were the aliens, I would be humoring us. After all, they have all the cards. They obviously, uh, any type of uh, of uh, military, you know, bomb, missile. I've heard that a Stinger missile supposedly shot down a UFO in Russia, but most of the time, when military forces use in the form of missiles, they don't work. And so the, the aliens have the superior technology, so anything they give us is going to be the utter minimum they can give us to keep us satisfied on whatever terms are negotiable. So, uh, you know. What, what about this talk, Bruce, that, uh, and you know, you've heard it, that we have some Star Wars weapon system, particle beams, uh, energy weapons that we are using to shoot down. Uh, various and sundry alien craft. Uh, you had one report you alluded to of a Stinger missile. That's ancient technology by today's standards in some ways. But is there any reason to believe that we might be actively trying to shoot down some visiting craft? Well, I would... I would uh, <clears throat> Aside from the I... utter stupidity of some action like that. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, that's something I'd be probably kind of touchy on for, for fear of setting off a, a much more powerful kind of reprisal. You know, you're you're in the world of speculation uh, with these flying saucer things, and I think it's all very interesting and all things. But I would like to bring us back to the world of business again, and uh, if you don't mind, is that all right? Go right ahead. It's perfectly fine. No problem. All right. Okay. And uh, I was thinking about the days of the Morgans and the Duponts and the Rockefellers. Well, who was Dallas. it that told? Who was it that told Tesla? Wasn't it Morgan? made the famous quote allegedly to Nikola Tesla when Tesla said we can just extract electricity from the air, basically, uh, with an antenna or something like that. And Morgan said, that's all well and good, but where are we going to put the meters? I don't know how true that was, but you're going back and bringing up uh, legendary names of tycoons and moguls who were the movers and shakers of the, the 19th and early, early 20th century. Well, what I'm in the context I'm bringing them up is, and that those people would have been highly upset if they had known that their bank records were being read and their mail was being read and their communications are being tapped. And the thing, the thing is, very, very, very highly upset. When did and privacy? When did privacy <laughs> go out the window, Bruce? When did we lose our privacy in the '60s and the '70s? This has been coming on for some time. Well, what I'm trying to say is. Yes, we've lost our privacy to a certain extent, but how can this loss in privacy be related to the fact that certain companies have established themselves <clears throat> and in their fields and cannot be dislodged by any other means because they have inside information, you see? And, right. and the, you see, there was a, it was a scandal in the States a few years back about the Internal Revenue Service because they had access to all the, the financial records of everybody. And if people had that information, it could be used at either blackmail people or intimidate them or, you know, this and that. And so here again, I get to the point about our world. <clears throat> Everybody knows that you have to have privacy in business communications. That goes without saying. If we're in a world where there's no privacy, does that mean that the powers that be or the secret government are given up on this kind of world that we're having? And, and we're, we may be led along to believe that we can still start a business and run something and be partially successful. But, that, but behind the scenes, the guys that really move the money are just laughing at us. And they don't even have to seek our approval anymore if they decide to go off on one of their adventures. So, 
uh, what is this is the kind of message which we should try to extract from the information or non-information we're getting on all the different levels you've referred to tonight, you know, from UFOs and flying saucers all the way down to, you know, food and electricity. You see what I'm saying? Oh, I do. I do. It's all it, part of the same continuum. It's all part of the same continuum. And, and the thing is, as a planetary group, we have to say to ourselves, have we been given up on? <laughs> are we the ones who are going to be the fall guys for all of the mistakes and greed of the past? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I go back to, yeah, I go back to your uh, supposition that maybe 50, 60 years ago, a lot of folks realized that this was headed... Uh, to hell in a handbasket, as they say, and that they were going to just sit back and profiteer on it and let it crash and then uh, survive in their underground cities and tunnels and bases and so forth and then come back to repopulate the planet with what? But the same exact mentality, right? <laughs> well, if you, had all, if, you had, uh, if you had enough money and you were faced with that kind of a situation, what would you do? Obviously I mean, the same thing, sure. I mean, after all, in order to have that much money, you have to be hung up on material goods and the states and houses. That's part of, the, part of the genome, isn't it, Bruce? I don't know whether it is or it isn't, but the thing is, uh, I don't know. Look, you know, we're talking to the people. We are talking to the people. That's what, what this radio thing is all about. And the people of any country get the government that they want. If they if they don't want to pay any attention to what's happening, then of course things will go on and as they do. And the thing is, if they do want to pay attention and make a little noise, then other things start happening. I hope for the good of all of us, for the for the safety of all of us, and the longevity of all of us, that we in the United States uh, look around and ask ourselves what are the important questions in our lives that need solving. And I think they are very simple ones, like we need enough food to live on, we need a roof over our homes, we need education for our children, we need health care. And <clears throat> beyond that, what is the use of a society? Even though we have a society or a government which is supposed to, through some collective activity, provide these services for us. That's why we do it. Other things like, uh, you know, thought patrols or outer space missions or alternative threes, I mean, they're not part of the citizens' agenda. Not usually, no. <laughs> Hold on now. We have to take one more uh, break and come back. We have more callers holding, Bruce, and we'll continue in just a couple minutes here at Sightings on the Radio. Welcome back to Sightings on the Radio. And we are back, and we have Lynn Holding calling in from San Antonio, listening in on Real Audio. Lynn, are you there? Lynn, are you there? Lynn can't hear me, I don't think. Okay, Bruce, can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Well, very steady and dependable Bruce De Palma, always there. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, not a whole lot of time left, and we have a caller who was holding, but we'll get on with the program as it is now and kind of get toward a summation of where we are. And I think the point, again, was uh, this may have been predictable uh, to some people long ago. And I, in a way, I certainly hope not, because, as you've said, nothing has been done to try to stem the tide of decay and destruction, which continues at a rate that is, uh, is really mind-boggling. And you also mentioned a very critical factor about the reduction in the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere, which is substantial. I've been told it's up to... Uh, 35% in days gone by and as low as uh, 10, well, not 10, but 20% now. So we've had a, a remarkable reduction in the amount of oxygen. And that is brought about, I guess, by the uh, rainforest destruction, chopping down of uh, forests in the northern hemisphere, and the damage to the ocean, which prevents the uh, plankton from producing oxygen as well. But this is all a very complex issue. And again, nothing has been done to really inform us about it. That's, that's correct. And... Uh... You have to ask yourself, uh, considering that governments are constituted and, you know, national science foundations and universities and so forth are constituted to be the early warning centers for the rest of us in the civilization. That's why we pay for them. That's why we establish them. They should have said to us, uh, look, folks, this is the most important problem in the world. We have to make a sustainable sustainable society on this planet or we will not be sustained 
we're going to die off and become extinct. So <clears throat> we see extinctions happening in a lot of other species around us, uh, but uh, it could happen to us. Uh, this is, and so I, this consciousness change that we're propitiating through these conversations is a part of the healing process, I feel, that the planet has to go through when we switch our priorities over into you know, a more natural channels. You know, when I got to New Zealand, I came to a place which I would say culturally is about 50 years, uh, 40 or 50 years behind the United States. We're back in the rock and roll era of the 50s and the 40s here in New Zealand. Hmm. And uh, Time place, travel. Well, it is like time travel, and it has its limitations and it has its advantages. Um the 50s, and if you can remember back, we were going to have a moon base, and we were going to Mars, and uh, it was a time of great promise. Atomic energy was going to give us all the energy we ever needed, and it was a very hopeful time. Yes, Tomorrowland was amazing. Yeah, and the South Pacific is like that. There's a lot of space here, and there's a lot of developing societies, and it's it's a wide-open territory, and it doesn't have any big military onus uh, hanging over it. It's not, uh, you know, well, people are, they're not interested in world power. Now, I think America should get less interested in, in world power, uh, but the trouble is that America runs on oil, and uh, uh, the Americans use, for every person in America, they use 30 times the world average of consumption of energy. Uh, 30 times. And... Uh, hmm. This wow. appetite for energy, uh, I might say that in New Zealand we use 20 times, but the Americans use the most at 30 times. But uh, this appetite for energy has to be satisfied, and in the short term, the only way to get it is to prevent other people from getting it if they're fixed resources, and that means that you build up your army, your navy, your air force, and everything. And, and everybody can read the papers and see what's happening. More violence, more armies, more guns and things, and... Do we have to, you know, do we have to put two and two together to make four? You can, you can see it all happening. And so you say to yourself, well, <clears throat> you know, I've been part of, in the 60s, I've been part of mobs and things. And there's a certain psychology to a mob that takes you over and, and you start doing and moving and going places where you wouldn't think you went before. And so there's a whole psychology of uh, the world, which is heading in a different direction, and it's sort of like a, a hypnosis or a thrall, and we're, we're going down this vortex, and we don't realize we're doing it, and we've got to snap out of it and say to ourselves, no, I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to snap out of this, and I'm going to turn this world into a place that I really am proud of living in, instead of complaining about, you see. And so this is a possibility, and... I do as much as I can from where I am to just get to people to think about it. And we've been, we've, been, we've been talked out of through the necessity of explanations for everything. We, we don't even roll over that's, in bed. That's a, really, that. that's a very important point. Uh, that's, <laughs> restate that, will you? That's really important. Well, you don't roll over in bed unless you have a reason, you see. And the thing is, there are a lot of things in this life you do without any reasons at all. I magnetized a gyroscope because I, because I just felt it might be more interesting. There's no reason for that. Uh, there was no reason for me to start doing these experiments. And, and a lot of times in life, for those who really come up with interesting things, they just sort of happen. And every time you start getting into the groove of thinking it's got to be according to the principles of Adam or or Newton or Galileo or somebody, um, you just close yourself off. Yeah, and a lot of people are closed. We're going to take our last break and come back with more here at Sightings on the Radio with Bruce De Palma in about three minutes. Stay with us. To sightings on the radio. Bruce DePalma tonight, just a fascinating program. The big problem, one of the big problems in communication, Bruce, is that the average person just doesn't understand, and they haven't been told otherwise, that our present systems just cannot clean up 
our polluted planet because they are continually polluting in the process. It's it's a it's a losing spiral. That's right. That's right. In order to create to, to clean up pollution, you have to create more pollution. Uh, and that sum total is not zero. It's, 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 you're worse off after you finish than if you hadn't done anything. You know, Helen Caldicott said, uh, I saw her speak a couple of years ago, and, and she said that the whole idea of recycling and recycled materials is absurd because, uh, well, for the exact reason you just stated. They're usually more expensive, they require energy to produce, and to recycle and the net gain is a minus. That's right, and, and what, would, what would turn the whole situation around, of course, energy runs any kind of recycling program, and if you could get the energy without pollution, then, of course, everything goes in the opposite direction. We just, get a... Yeah. All right, and uh, look, I just w- want to say this. We were, this is the last uh, sum up, I guess, of this program, but there, there's something you have to, and the listeners have to get into their brains, and that is that if you don't believe in yourself, and if you don't believe in that a given group of people can't get themselves together, live harmoniously, and have productive and satisfying lives, then anything we're doing is right out the window. But let's just forget about it, because anything else than that is just another great dictator or power trip or you do this or you do that type scenario. So we have to have an I do I have an ultimate faith in that, that human beings, given their own lead, will get themselves together and come up with whatever they need to come up with to get out of whatever situation presents itself to them. And, you know, there's an old saying that you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time is just as true now as it, is when it was said. I think it was Abraham Lincoln that said it. Mm-hmm. So... uh I have faith in people, and I, I have faith that if we continue to do what we do and put out the information and say, just think about things, there's no speed limit on anything, including electrical generators, and anything can be changed, anything can be improved, and the only thing that will happen is everything will go to bits if you don't do anything. That is the only assured thing you can be guaranteed of. <laughs> you can't sit around waiting for the second coming or the new millennium or anything. It's, uh, it's, it's time to get up, stand up, and do something. You know, there's, That's another right. saying, there's another saying that, uh, real simple, I, I like to, to, uh, to put this out occasionally. Sooner or later, everybody stumbles across the truth. Unfortunately, most people pick themselves up and continue on as if nothing had happened. <laughs> well, along the same lines, when I was in physics grad school at Harvard, uh, someone said to me, the only question you don't ask around here is why. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> That's a great one. I'm going to give uh, Bruce De Palma's website address again. It's www.com. De Palma, that's D E P A L M A dot org, O R G dot N Z. Bruce, it's been a great show. I really thank you for your time, and I think uh, the message has been received by a lot of people tonight. Thanks a lot. Thank you, and we'll talk to you again. It's a pleasure. Okay, Bruce, good night. Bye bye from the South Pacific. And thanks very much for all of you uh, spending time with me tonight here. I'll be back tomorrow night for another edition of Sightings on the Radio. Until then, have yourselves a great night, and good luck.